Okay, so in the second part of this video, um, I basically want to return back to, and I haven't erased it yet, I want to return back to this rule and prove to you that this must be the case, that this rule must be true if we're maximizing utility subject to my income constraint. Okay, now let's, we're going to do this with, um, in three steps. But let's remember what we're trying to do here. The whole point of this chapter is that we're trying to understand that in a world where we face a lot of different goods that we can purchase, right, that each time we buy a good, there's a cost to us, right, we have to use some of our scarce income to buy it, and we're trying to be as happy as we can be, satisfied as we can be. So basically, how do we get the happiest we can at the cheapest price? Essentially, that's what we're going to try to do here. And we're going to do this with... Um, in a three-step process. Uh, first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to describe preferences. Second step is that we're going to describe the income price constraint. Essentially, we're going to look at our preferences, that's going to be our utility notions, then we're going to look at income and prices, basically price, and then we're going to combine these steps. So let's start with step number one, preferences. Um, we know that our preferences, again, the, the, the variable that we're looking at here is utility. And um, with that said, is we're going to... Um, have this notion where we can have a bundle of goods, right? Let's say goods X again and good Y. And in this bundle of good, we're going to be able to compare bundles of goods to each other. Our preferences for these bundles are going to have four properties. All bundles must, must, must fulfill these properties. And I'll explain each of them in turn. In turn. First, oh, let's put it here. What conditions must prefer preferences fulfill? They must be complete, transitive, reflexive and have the property of non-satiation. For something to be, for preferences to be complete, basically what that means is that all bundles have to be able to be compared to one another. And there's only three types of relationships that can exist between two bundles. Again, a bundle of good being a, you know, quantity of Crest toothpaste and a quantity of sushi. Okay, so I have one bundle that has like, let's say, eight units of sushi, two units of crest. Another one could have six units of crest and uh, one unit of sushi, right? We could have, we have various combinations of these two goods. With the first condition of completeness, those two bundles that I've set up have to be, um, have one of two relationships. Let's just kind of write this out here. I'm going to use my sushi and crust example. So S standing for the sushi product, C standing for the crust object. If this is my bundle one, and this is my bundle two, so six sushi and three crusts, five sushis and four crusts, for completeness to exist, the three one of the three relationships must exist. They must either have it be preferred, not preferred, or the third would be indifferent. 
either I must want one more than two, right? Because it makes more what? Because it makes more ordinal utility, right? Either one must have more ordinal utility than two, or one must have less ordinal utility than two, or for the third, indifferent, they have the same amount of ordinal utility. Because theoretically, two bundles that generate the same amount of ordinal utility, same amount of satisfaction, I, would, I wouldn't care which one I would receive. To be indifferent between two bundles means you get exactly the same amount of satisfaction, and you wouldn't care which one you received. So you must strictly prefer something, strictly not prefer it, or be indifferent, with your preference for that product being determined by your amount of ordinal utility. Now, for our second characteristic, transitive. Basically, what this would mean for us is that they um, are logically consistent, right? That if I prefer bundle 1 to 2, and that if I prefer bundle 2 to 3, that I must also then prefer bundle 1 to 3, right? Because um, Otherwise, they wouldn't be logically consistent with one another. So basically, the transitive condition just says that preferences are logically consistent. Reflexive basically just says it doesn't matter what order these appear in the bundle, right? That's something that's success in 3C. If instead it was 3C success, that those two bundles would be indifferent, right? Because they contain the same products, just in a different order. So reflexive, kind of think of it like in a mirror sense, right? If you if you were to show that bundle in the mirror, the, the crest would appear now before the sushi. The bundle is essentially the same, though. Um, and then finally, non-satiation, which is basically a fancy way of saying more is always better. So we're going to presume here that the total utility curve is always increasing, or alternatively, the marginal utility curve never crosses that x-axis. So we have four conditions. Completeness, every bundle has to be compared to one another. Transitivity, they are logically consistent. Third, reflexivity, meaning that we can have the bundle, the objects in the bundle, appear in any order. And then finally, non-satiation. More of a good is always better. Okay. With that said, what we then want to do is create what's called an indifference curve or preference space. So I'm going to have my products, sushi and crest. Here's my quantity of crest, my quantity of sushi. Based on my knowledge about these four conditions, transitivity, completeness, uh, reflexivity, and non-satiation, based on those four notions of how um, they exist. If I were to place um, two bundles here, bundle 1 and bundle 2. I know the relationship between bundle 1 and 2, right? The bundle 1 must be preferred to bundle 2. And I know that that must be the case because bundle 1 has both more crest and more sushi. And the non-satiation assumption, which says more is always better, if it contains more of both goods, it must be strictly preferred to bundle 2. Alternatively, bundle 2 is not preferred to bundle 1. So now, if we were to have a third bundle, let's just place it in the middle here, bundle 3, right? 1 is preferred to 3, 3 is preferred to 2, 
1 is preferred to 2. We know that based on transitivity, right? The logical nature of these. Now, what we know for certain, if I were to just kind of make some dashed lines here, to kind of reflect the quantities. I basically know that anything in that quadrant, the one that I just put hash lines in, anything in that quadrant, any bundle in that quadrant, must be preferred to bundle 3. Why? Because of non-satiation. Right? It would have more of both goods if it's in this quadrant. Alternatively, right? anything in this quadrant, bundle 3 would be preferred to anything in this quadrant, because bundle 3 would have more of both goods. What about these two areas? Completeness tells us that there must be some relationship. right? So if I put a bundle 4 here, let's erase these um, question marks here. Right? The question is, what is the relationship of 3 to 4, of 3 to 5, and of even 4 to 5? Unfortunately, reliance on those four conditions is not going to be enough information to tell us. We know that some relationship must exist, but we would actually have to have some numbers, some numbers to calculate here. Um, what we, what we could do is, if we had some numbers, we could draw what's called an indifference curve. And what this indifference curve will do is it will trace out all of the bundles that have the same amount of ordinal utility. What that bundle would do, or what this indifference curve would do, is it would have the same amount of utility on it. So let's say it's like 100. So all of the points on this curve are going to have the same amount of ordinal utility. Anything on a lower curve would be not preferred to anything on this higher curve. So you're, in essence, you're going to want the highest indifference curve possible, possible. And this entire space is going to be filled with indifference curves. So let's just fix up this picture here a little bit. We're then going to have a series of non-intersecting indifference curves. Where the utility is constant along each of these curves. They will never, ever, ever intersect. They can intersect, because if they were to intersect, right, we can prove to you that they can't intersect. Because if they were to intersect, then if 1 and 2 were indifferent because they're on the same indifference curve, and 1 and 3 were indifference because they are also on the same indifference curve, then 2 would have to be indifferent to 3, right, based on transitivity. But they aren't, because 2 is more of both goods than 3. So 2 is preferred to 3 rather than um, indifferent to 3. So we would have a violation of our um, non-satiation assumption. Just the non-satiation assumption would be violated. So these indifference curves, um, they don't intersect. And the slope of the indifference curve
right? Quantity of sushi, quantity of crest, same indifference, same ut ordinal utility along the curve. The slope of this indifference curve is called the marginal rate of substitution. And in this case, what it's going to be is the marginal, it's going to be obviously negative here because it's downward sloping. It's going to be the negative ratio of the marginal utility of the good on the x-axis over the marginal utility of the good on the y-axis. Essentially what the marginal rate of substitution tells us is Right, as I get more of good on the x-axis crest, from left to right, the numerator would be falling. We know that it would be falling because of the law of diminishing marginal utility. As we go from left to right, we're also falling here. So this would be getting larger. Numerator would be getting smaller denominator would be getting larger. You could see it's getting flatter and flatter and flatter. We know that this is falling and this is getting larger because right, of the law of diminishing marginal utility. And basically what the marginal rate of substitution tells us is if I wanted to keep my satisfaction or happiness the same, by consuming less of one good and more of another, how much exactly would I have to consume more or less of the other good in order to equalize out my total utility across both products? Right. So if I can have crest and sushi, um, the act of consuming less sushi must mean that I have to consume more crest. If I consume one less piece of sushi, basically the question is how much more crest would I have to consume to be equally happy? Okay. Um, the goal here for the consumer is going to be to be on the highest indifference curve possible. Right? So this again, the space is filled up all the way out to infinity with indifference curves. You want to have the highest ordinal utility possible. So the goal The goal here is to be on the highest indifference curve. That's the goal. There's going to be a constraint. Um, we're going to deal with that constraint in the next video. I'm going to try to break up these videos into smaller pieces um, so it's a little bit more digestible. So what we've done here is looked at the first step, preferences. In the next one, we're going to look at the constraint.